Hi, my name is Andy and uh, I'm going to introduce you to a little programming language called Elm by showing you how I wrote a snake program in it. First of all, I'm just going to prove to you uh, that I really did write a snake program in it, just in case you didn't believe me. So, here we go. This is my snake program written in Elm. It's running inside a web browser um, because Elm compiles into JavaScript and it works. Uh, let me show you a bit of code just to prove to you. I wrote some code. Uh, so stuff at the top is importing things that you need, some constants. Then we define a model, which is um, everything about the state of our program. Uh, uh, then we define the code that updates that model when something happens. Uh, and then further down here, we say how to turn that model into HTML. Uh, an HTML DOM, which is then rendered onto the screen in a very performant way. Um, if you're looking carefully, you can see the syntax looks a little bit like Haskell. But don't let that put you off. It's very practical, very uh, 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 easy to get into actually really doing something and figuring out whether it works. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, why we do Snake, and we're going to talk a little bit about what Elm is, and then I'm going to go into a bit more detail about my first impressions of Elm. This is really the first proper program I've written in Elm. Since I wrote this, I've written another one, and I continue to be really excited about it. Um, we're going to talk about how the syntax is inspired by Haskell and how that can be scary and off-putting. Um, we're going to talk about how to generate HTML in Elm briefly. Um, we're going to discuss these things called signals uh, and then how to find out more. Okay, so why write Snake uh, uh, in a new programming language? Well, just because I like writing Snake. Um, I've done that since. I first started programming every language that I've come across, I write Snake in it. I like it. Um, it's a good reference point for me because I've done it in a lot of languages. Um, it's a pretty easy thing to write. I can do it in the amount of time required to prepare one of these videos. Um, but it does require interesting stuff like a user interface uh, and input and uh, stuff like that. Okay, so what is Elm? Why would we be interested in Elm? Well, one way of putting what Elm is, which might put you off and might make you very excited, is that Elm's a little bit like being able to write Haskell in your web browser instead of having to write JavaScript. Um, it compiles down to JavaScript so the people using your website don't need to know you've used Elm. Um, you're writing completely pure functional code, but the really exciting thing about Elm is it's really uh, immediate and embedded in the real world. You're immediately writing um, a web page that is uh, definitely a real thing. It's not just this abstract functional programming exercise. Um, the user interfaces um, written in Elm, not only are they uh, easy to understand in terms of code because it's all functional, they're also really fast. Um, the style of programming is called functional reactive programming, which is a kind of um, philosophy of how to write user interfaces um, that's been built up over the last few years and seems like a really good idea to me. So if you take nothing else away from this video, perhaps you can apply some of the um, principles of functional reactive programming uh, to your, the code you're writing now. Uh, Elm has a increasingly helpful compiler. Uh, they're working very hard on making it more and more helpful in terms of the error messages that it gives you. Uh, they also have a time machine debugger that I can't get to work. Uh, by a time machine debugger I mean something that lets you go lets you go r run backwards and forwards through what your program did and examine exactly what happened at each moment. Just scroll back and forth through time. It's really nice. Okay, so what is uh, Elm's structure for writing a program? Well, it's some diamonds. The, the diamonds in this picture mean like pure, lovely, functional code that can't have anything weird going on with it with um, a singleton or global variable or anything like that. It's all just lovely functional code that you can understand and predict how it works exactly. So, if we start in the bottom left, we can see uh, that there's this thing called init, uh, which is basically a function to get you started to make a model. So you make a model, and then that model is completely immutable. It can't be changed by anything else. Uh, it, uh, if you if you do make changes, what you're actually doing is making another copy, a new copy of it. So anyway, you, you have this init uh, function. It makes a model, and then uh, that red arrow pointing to the view means that you then write really nice, beautiful functional code that produces a view of your model, i.e. it tells, uh, it, it builds a kind of representation of the HTML DOM that you want to display in your browser. Um, then uh, Elm itself, you don't have to worry about it, but Elm in, itself then turns 
your beautiful um, immutable representation of a DOM produced by functional code uh, into a diff against what the actual state of the real DOM in the browser is. And it does all the horrible potato work in the top right of changing the DOM in the browser um, to look like how you said it should look. You don't have to worry about it. So that's where the horrible non-functional stuff happens. Um, and then also what can come back from the browser is stuff that happened and those are handled via this mechanism called signals. Um, uh, signals come back from the browser and they and every time a signal happens, which could be something happening like a, someone clicking on something or it could be because a timer that you set up went off or a, re a request that you um, sent comes back again, something like that. Um, then uh, your pure functional code called update will, will run and what that does is it looks at the current model, it looks at what signals happened or whatever, what's, what's happened, produces another model and then the cycle continues with producing a view of that model and stuff like that. What this means in practice is you produce um, clean pure functional code um, for your view and your updates and your model is a completely immutable thing that you can just return another copy of in your update method, update function. Um, you're writing functional code, but lots of uh, state is happening, is flowing through your code rather than uh, belonging to your code. So this model uh, is changing, uh, the signals are changing, and your code is completely predictable functional code, but causing real-life changes in, in a, a, a real-life browser DOM. Uh, not just a DOM, you know, other stuff in the real world. So let me try and uh, explain why that feels so much better than normal JavaScript. If you're, uh, whenever I'm writing a JavaScript program, after a little while, I start getting really panicky about what on earth is going on. Uh, some kind of events happening. It's changing some kind of state that's held somewhere. Um, I'm not quite sure what state it's going to be in before or after that event happened, and how that's going to interact with other events that might be happening at the same time or nearly the same time. Um, Whenever I write JavaScript, I soon feel like it's really tangled. Now, I'm sure that's my fault. But um, when I'm writing Elm, I don't have that feeling. Elm is uh, protecting me from myself from writing this kind of tangled code that um, has lots of different bits of state that you can't predict. Because um, every all the state that you have has to be represented in this thing called model. Otherwise, it, it, it can't... Uh, it can't appear in the UI, it can't do anything. So you, you're constrained to make this model work uh, work that way, which means your model then has a really clear picture of what the state of your, what the actual things are that are the state of your program. Um, and the update function is a really clear way of showing how that state changes. Um, all your functions are pure, so there's nothing, there's no side effects going on, nothing's um, sneaking in from somewhere else. Um, and, and as I was saying, the state flows through your code instead of you having to um, hold on to state and, and track how it changes. And basically, my my experience so far of working with this is that it feels really safe. Um, I don't end up with bugs where something happened in an order I wasn't expecting or something like that, because the order of stuff coming into the update function is very straightforward. It, 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 the update function gets told what's, what, what's happening, and you tell it what happens to the model in response to that. It really is great. However, um, there are some prices to pay for this. If you are not used to Haskell, I mean, if you are used to Haskell, then you, I think you're probably already sold uh, on Elm. But uh, if, like me, you're not used to Haskell, you've only tried it out, or you kind of feel like you should learn it in the future, um, then yes, in order to use Elm, you have to dive into a syntax which is quite unfamiliar, a type system which is quite strict, which is obviously, in my opinion, a good thing, but it comes with some pain as you get used to it. Um, and to me, actually, the thing that really makes this difficult is just syntax. And once I got the hang of the syntax, um, it, it became a lot less painful. I really feel like the concepts were reasonably familiar to me, and, and it was just a matter of getting hold of where you put the curly brackets and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm sort of getting there myself. I, I think you will too. I haven't been at it very long. Anyway, so here's an example of a bit of um, uh, syntax. In uh, This is the way you uh, make... Uh, a little bit of, of my model in my snake game. So this is uh, this looks quite nice and familiar, doesn't it? It looks a little bit like some JSON or something. You're saying a snake consists of two things, uh, a direction and a body. And uh, a body is a list of points. Uh, so that's the way you express some things. And then this is another example that's intended to show you that um, 
the Haskell syntax isn't that bad. This is a function called grow snake, which takes in a list of points and returns a list of points. And um, uh, so that's the top line telling you the kind of signature of the function. The line below tells you the implementation of the function. So it takes in a body and then the after the equals sign, that's the um, the uh, implementation of the function. So it returns that body that it was given in and then appended onto that um, an array of five points. So that repeat five means do um, make a list of this this thing five with five copies of it, and then the thing that we're making a list of is this point, uh, which is at zero comma zero. So basically, the return value will be body, but with five extra points added on at the end, which are all at zero zero. So this is what happens when you eat an apple in the snake game. You get an extra. Um, your snake becomes five longer. And those points are actually at zero zero, so you can't see them until the snake moves a bit, and then the tail gradually expands. See what I mean? Anyway, so that's that's me trying to convince you that uh, Haskell syntax isn't that bad. It's actually quite logical. You just it, the thing on the left equals some stuff on the right, um, and then this is my thing to show you that sometimes the Haskell syntax can get pretty complicated for what is actually what you thought was quite a simple thing. And actually, in some ways, this syntax or actually just the, the process of pure functional strongly typed programming is revealing that there's more complexity in your in what you're doing than you thought. Um, one of the examples that you'll come across relatively early if you're writing something like a game is that there's more complexity in random numbers than you thought because actually a random number generator is a piece of state um, so in order to use random numbers in pure functional code you have to pass uh, your random seed or some kind of random number generator or around all through your program and return back a modified version of it. Once you've generated a, a random number out of it, the random number generator has to be different. Otherwise, next time you ask for a random number, you get the same number. So, here's an example of what looks like a simple function, which is a function called eat apple, which takes in a model and returns a different model where the apple has been eaten and the snake's got longer. Um, but as you can see, because of various things like, for example, uh, the body of a snake is a list, and if that list's empty, then we're going to fail to find the head of the list. Um, so we have to handle that case, even though we happen to know in this case that that list will never be empty, which is pretty annoying. Perhaps I could have done better with that, or perhaps if Elm grows a few more features, that would be easier to deal with. Perhaps we could declare in the type of the list that it's never empty or something, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, and then loads, and then, yeah, basically there's a lot of code there for basically something that in my other implementations of Snake was just like place the apple in a new place and make the snake a bit longer. In this case, we're returning a whole new model where the apple position is different, the random seed is different, and the snake has undergone this grow snake process that we saw on the previous slide. Anyway, point is, uh, this is hard to deal with until you get used to it. Once you get used to it, you realize why this complexity is here. It's because actually that complexity was hidden from you when you were writing non-functional code. Um, and you, you grow to love it, probably. Uh, also, Haskell just looks a bit weird. So this, this is the uh, first time I saw a, a function signature like this. I was confused by it. I now, I now feel pretty familiar with it. So basically, this is talking about a function called view, and then after the colon, there's a list of things separated by these these arrow symbols. The last thing is the return value, and all the things before that are the parameters that you can pass into the function. The reason it's uh, uh, displayed in this slightly confusing way, where the return value is just kind of at the end of the list, is because if you want to, you can call this function only pass in one argument, and then and then that um, that function has been curried, which means that you can uh, pass that thing around, which is kind of half a it's a function with half of its arguments supplied, uh, not all of them. You can pass that to something else and supply one of those arguments later. Uh, it's really cool. It's a really brilliant thing, currying. But anyway, it makes this look really confusing first of all, and then it's extra confusing because the first parameter here is a signal dot address action, and so signal dot address is just uh, kind of a namespacing um, address is kind of inside that name signal. And then the the space action mean it thing is like generic types or something like that. So um, the the address has to have a kind of type to say what type of address it is or what um, the 
uh, what kind of address it can be, and the kind of address it can be as a, an action. So ac action. So if you're writing Java, action would be between diagonal brackets here. And once you've got the hang of things like that syntax, um, it makes sense. And actually, interestingly, I chose these examples because they were very confusing to me. Having done a little bit more Elm, only a f you know a couple more weeks of it. They now look really straightforward to me. I'm almost wondering, you know, why did I choose this example? But I have to try and get back into your shoes. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, okay. So next thing to talk about um, in Elm, how do you make HTML? I should point out that at the moment, uh, most of the, the literature and documentation about Elm is really focused on making dynamic websites. In theory, it could be used for, uh, for example, you know, server-side um, programming or something like that. But in practice, what I've seen it being used for is to um, make dynamic websites. The way you do that is you make HTML using this module called HTML, um, which basically um, you take in your model and a kind of a place where you can send signals to, which is what this address thing is, and you return um, your representation of a DOM. So here we've got this thing, this function called div, which takes in two arguments. First argument is a list of um, attributes basically and the second argument is a list of uh, HTML elements that go inside so what we're saying is make a div set its class to be main div and inside it uh, 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 just have one element which is just a piece of text called hello so you can see at the bottom of the screen there um, this is the HTML you would get back uh, if your if your function looked like the top make sense and what this does mean is that when you're making your DOM, you can use as much clever code as you like, uh, and the output of it will still be just plain HTML. So as far as the browser's concerned, you, um, you're just you're just producing kind of raw HTML, and actually it's doing this HTML diffing process, which is a very quick way of um, um, making performant uh, animations in web pages. And there's some information on the Elm website about just how fast it is, and it is among the fastest of the um, frameworks for doing uh, sort of making changes to the DOM. Um, anyway, uh, that's anyway. Yeah, that was worth saying. Uh, so, uh, all this is is an example of some clever code. So I'm using the map list dot map uh, function. This is a bit a snippet of code from from the actual Snake code. Uh, what we're doing is we're passing in a function to call for every um, for every number between one and, and the size of the model. So we're basically saying, make me a tr um, for every number between one and the size of the model. So basically, uh, we make this is the code that makes all the rows um, of a table, which is what represents the the snake in our, our snake game. By the way, whether using a table was a good idea, I don't know seem to work it's probably not very probably not the most performant thing to do anyway the point about this is we're using this clever function called map which calls a function on everything in an array um, uh, but then uh, the output of that is just some plain HTML the browser never sees how clever we were being to produce it okay so uh, other things that happen when we're interacting with the world we need stuff to happen like uh, we need to find out that some time has passed or that the user has pressed a key so what we do is we define a type called action, which could be either um, a tick or a key press. So that pipe symbol separates the uh, the two possible things an action could be. Um, and then in our update function, which is the thing that takes in a model and returns back an updated model, um, we take in an action and a model. That's what um, those first two things separated by arrow symbols are on the line that begins update colon. We return back a model and uh, some, whatever, some other stuff we want to do, which is this effects thing. Um, and then the actual implementation of the function uses a case statement, which is like a switch, uh, but much stricter. It based, and it's based on the type of the, um, the object. So we're saying, have a look at action and tell me what type it is. So we know that action is of type action, and we know that we defined on that first line an action can be one of two things, a tick or a key press. So this case thing basically lets us split up those two cases. So the first bit is if action is a tick, do this, and if action is a key press, do that. And basically what we do is uh, 
we just do something to the model, return back a changed model, and we also return this some, an effects thing, which basically um, is either asking for nothing to happen as, as a result of this, if you press the key, or um, for another tick to be generated for us next time. Uh, anyway, that's just an example of how um, information comes in from the outside world, and what happens is your update function gets called, you return a modified model and possibly some information about what other stuff you want to happen. Um, uh, and everything is completely well defined. It, it, you could write uh, a test saying uh, if I get the, the up arrow key press under these circumstances then my model will change to look like this. And it, um, if your test passes you know that there's no nothing external that can make that fail under some other circumstances. Everything is completely pure. Your update function is a pure functional function. Um, nothing can mess it up if it works. Um, and here's an example of how you would construct your DOM in order to be able to receive um, those signals. So in this case, this is the view function. It's taking in this thing called a signal dot address action and a model, and it's returning uh, a piece of HTML, you know, an HTML DOM basically. And in this case, what we're doing is we're returning a div. And the div has the, inside it. It has this table model thing, the, the ta uh, game table thing, which we won't look at. But that's just you know the the actual table that makes it look like a snake. But it also has an attribute called on key down, which is like the um, uh, HTML attribute on key down. I is waiting waiting for a key to get pressed. But instead of us saying when when a key is pressed, run this function. What we say is when a key is pressed send this type of action to this address. So that address that got passed into us is basically the place where signals are allowed to get sent. Where We're saying, please send your signals to this place. And that place is given to us by Elm. We don't really know what it is or where it is. Um, we just use it and say, when there's a key down event on this div, send a key press signal to this address. And it just handles the rest of it for us. And that key press will come into our update function. Um, as we saw a minute ago, and that's it. So Elm is basically um, a way of writing code that feels really safe and predictable, um, but is really close to the real world. It's a lot of fun to write it. You can write um, a simple little widget that does uh, one thing, get it exactly right, know that it responds exactly the right way to all the possible things that could happen, and then you can incorporate that into a bigger piece of code uh, and you know that you can't mess it up and uh, have, actu have ended up actually um, that your wider code messing up the, the little bit of uh, beautiful code that you wrote that you know works. Once you know it works, if you don't change it, it's going to stay working. Uh, you can, But you can incorporate it into a bigger thing, a bigger system. Um, there's, a, there's a page called the Elm Architecture on the... Um, on the Elm website that explains exactly how you incorporate things into bigger things, but the point is that this functional reactive programming lark is just really a lot safer, a lot less stressful. If it worries you that you're not quite sure whether your code really works or not, um, you're going to love functional reactive programming. And also, all these functional um, functions that you're writing are completely open to being unit tested in a way that a lot of UI code often isn't. Uh, and there is a, a, a Elm unit testing and um, um, a random testing framework that, uh, that that is also available that I haven't done a lot with um, but you can start actually unit testing your user interface code um, especially things like the update function um, without it being dependent on r running in a web browser you know it's great okay anyway so um, if you'd like to support me uh, in making these videos you absolutely do not have to but if you would like to uh, go to my Patreon page and sign up to donate like a dollar every time I make a video, which recently isn't very often, so it won't cost you very much. Um, also, play my game called Rabbit Escape. There's a desktop version, there's an Android version. On the Play Store it costs 60p, or if you can't afford 60p, go to the Rabbit Escape website. Um, you can download it for free. Uh, there's my video page. You can follow me on Twitter for um, links to videos and links to blog posts. Read my blog for stuff that I've found out about programming and other stuff. Go to artificialworlds.net for um, links to all of my different open source projects, which over the years have, have come out to be quite a few. Uh, that's it. See you next time.